It's good to see everybody out this morning. You know, welcome everybody, especially if you're a visitor. I want you to know that we greatly appreciate you being here and would uh, encourage you to come back anytime you can. Just a few announcements before we get started. Uh, Bill Davis is in rehab after breaking his hip. He is at NEA and is in room 5222, and he likes to, to have visitors. Uh, Carolyn Linderman is uh, still in a lot of pain. Um, she won't be getting the stint out until the 19th, so please keep her in your prayers. Uh, Lauren Phillips' grandmother placed on hospice, so again, prayers for that family. Uh, Mandy, and you'll have to forgive me, I can't remember how to say the last name. Um, Obaye? Mandy Obaye uh, has a swollen arm after her COVID booster. Sound like it was a pretty good one, so keep her in your prayers. Uh, congratulations to Jorge and Madison. Uh, they were married yesterday afternoon. Uh, Cindy and Santa Wright's father, Cliff Wright, fell and broke his right hip and is still recovering from a broken left hip. So definitely keep them in your prayers. Um, he had surgery Saturday, and he's waiting for rehab. <clears throat> Our ladies will meet at 10 a.m. tomorrow for a devotional. Um, there'll be a ladies' Christmas breakfast Saturday, December 17th at 8.30. Uh, that will also serve as a secret sister reveal. Um, so obviously, you know, if you're part of that secret sister, you'll want to be there. And even if you're not, you're still invited to come. Uh, there will be a sign-up sheet in the foyer placed. There will be a brief informational meeting for 2023's food ministry directly after church next Sunday, the 18th. Uh, so all are welcome to come and sit in that. Is there anything that I've overlooked, forgot to mention? No. <clears throat> all right, if there's nothing else, uh, we'll start worship with a prayer. And just encourage everyone to to put yourself in the right mind frame and, and be ready to worship God. Bow with me, please. Dear most gracious and heavenly Father, thank you for this day you've given us to come worship you and sing songs of praise to you, dear Lord, and fellowship with fellow Christians. And Dear Lord, we, we ask that you be with those mentioned earlier and bring them back to their much needed health dear lord and dear lord we ask that we go through this service and everything that we do is is in the manner that is well pleasing your side and we thank you for sending your son to die on the cross in christ's name we pray amen, amen. good morning <clears throat> For all that you've done, I will thank you. For all that you're going to do. For all that you promised and all that you are is all that has carried me through. Jesus, I thank you. And I thank you. Thank you. Lord. And I thank you, thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving and setting me free. Thank you for giving your life just for me. How I thank you, Jesus, I thank you. Gratefully thank you. You thank you, and I thank you, thank you, Lord, and I thank you, thank you, Lord, thank you for loving and setting me free. 
Thank you for giving your life just for me. How I thank you. Jesus, I thank you. Gratefully thank you. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Lord. It is children's time. Come on up, kiddos. Is that everybody? Okay. So, who can tell me what it means to be hurtful? Liza can. Okay, Liza, what's it mean to be hurtful? That's what it means to get hurt. Go ahead, Kinsey. Okay, being mean to others and not respecting the golden rule. Arian. Yeah. Okay. So who wants to help me for a second? Come here, Sadie. All right. I want you to grab this toothpaste, and I want you to squeeze as much as you can onto that plate. Squeeze as hard as you can. Keep squeezing. Keep going. Y'all got to forgive my sound effects. Is that as much as you can get out, Sadie? No, not yet. You have your daddy's determination, don't you? She's gonna get every drop out of it. She, she's even twisting the, the tube over here. Is that it? All right. <laughs> All right. Now, no, hold on, hold on, Sadie. Now put it all back. <laughs> all right. So can you get it? So can you get it back in the tube, Sadie? That carpet's gonna be minty fresh. So could you get it back in the tube, Sadie? You can't get the toothpaste back in the tube once you squeeze it out. I did say Sadie's name, that's right. So when you say something hurtful, can you take it back? Is it forever said? What does the Bible tell us to do? Does it tell us to say hurtful things? What's it tell us to do? Say nice things. That's right, right. It t the Bible tells us to say nice things, not hurtful things, because when we hurt people, we can't take it back. That's why it's always important for us to do what the Bible says and for us to be good Christian examples and be good examples and say nice things, right? Okay, we're going to say a prayer real quick and then we're going to go back, okay? So everybody bow your heads for me.
Dear God, thank you for this day and all the many blessings in it. We ask, we want to thank you for each one of these children and families represented here, and we ask a special blessing upon them. We ask that you continue to bless us here at Grace Point and help us to raise our children in a way that will further your kingdom in the future. Please forgive us when we fail thee and give us a home in heaven with thee in the end. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. job. Maybe we should exit the stage like that. <laughs> My bones are too broke. <clears throat> I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he still storm Galilee. I believe that he walked on the water. And I believe that he's the answer for me. Yes, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. And I believe that the tomb was found empty. And I believe that he's the answer for me. I believe in the words of the Bible. How he made the poor blind man to see. I believe that the deaf ears were opened. And I believe he's made a difference in me. Yes, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. And I believe that the tomb was found empty. And I believe that he's the answer for me. I believe that he spoke to dead Lazarus. And he said, unbind and set free. I believe that he reigns up in heaven. And I believe that he is coming again. Yes, I believe in the one they call Jesus. I believe he died on Mount Calvary. And I believe that the tomb was found empty. And I believe that he's the answer for me. Amen. <clears throat> when my love to Christ grows weak, when for deeper faith I seek, then in thought I go to Thee, Garden of Gethsemane. 
There I walk amid the shades While the lingering twilight fades See that soft ring, friendless one Weeping, praying there alone When my love for man grows weak When for stronger faith I seek Hill of Calvary, I go to thy scenes of fear and woe. There behold his agony, suffered on the anguish see his faith love triumphant still in death then to life I turn again learning all the worth of pain Learning all the might that lies in a full self sacrifice. Jesus, when he was giving the Last Supper with his disciples, said he broke the bread and said, do this in remembrance of me. He gave of the fruit of the vine and said, do this in remembrance of the blood that I shed. Every first day of the week, that's what we come together to do besides giving praise and worship to God. We also come to remember that sacrifice which he made for us upon the cross. Will you bow? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer as we are about to break the bread which represents your son's body which was broken upon the cross so that we might one day spend eternity with you in heaven. And we pray, Father, that we keep this in remembrance during this time and as we go through our day-to-day -day activities through the week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Will you bow? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer again as we are about to partake of the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood which was shed so that we might have the forgiveness of sins. We thank you, Father, for allowing your Son to come down to earth and live as man and bear our burdens upon the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Separate from the Lord's Supper, where we take the time to remember the sacrifice Christ made, we also take the time to pass the plate so that we can give back a little of the blessings that we've received in life from God so that others might continue to be blessed also. Will you bow? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer as we are about to pass the plate. and We pray, Father, that we give with a cheerful heart and keep in remembrance all the blessings you have given us in life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank <laughs> For a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly foe, a faith that shines more bright and clear when tempests rage without. That when in danger knows no fear, in darkness feels no doubt. Lord, give us such a faith as
as this, and then when air may come, we're tasting here the hallowed bliss of an eternal home. <clears throat> if it's convenient for you, would you stand for this song and remain standing for the scripture reading to follow? I care not today what the morrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth o'er everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding, in his great love. From all harm safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Though tempest may blow and the storm clouds arise, obscuring the brightness of life. I'm never alarmed at the overcast skies, the Master looks on at the strife. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in his great love. From a heart safe in his sheltering arm, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. Our Lord will return to this earth some sweet day our troubles will then all be o'er. The Master so gently will lead us away beyond that blessed heavenly shore. Living by faith in Jesus above, <clears throat> trusting, confiding in His great love. In his shattering arm, I'm living by faith and fear no alarm. Scripture reading this morning will be taken from John. Chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. Now Thomas, one of the uh, twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails, and place my finger into the marks of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You may be seated. Well, 
Well, good morning, church. Such a wonderful day to be with you all here today. Many can't. Be mindful of those who are sick. It's going around. It's getting everybody. Luckily, I've avoided it so far. Knock on wood. I don't like when I'm coughing up here in front of y'all. I'm sure you don't like it either. So hopefully I avoid it. And if your family's dealing with it, hopefully they recover from it quickly so they can be back with us. Good holiday season coming up for my family. Hopefully you're looking forward that, to that as well. Great next year coming for Grace Point. A lot of good things going on. So pay attention, plug yourself in. But members and guests alike, I'm so glad you're here today. Turn to John 20. That's where we'll be in just a bit. Last week we took a break from our Life of Christ series uh, appropriately to look at the spirit of giving, acknowledging, Acknowledging our blessings, acknowledging that for Grace Point to continue, we need to be a people of grace. But now we're getting back into our Life of Christ series, and it's almost over. It'll end as the month ends. We've looked at the Life of Christ this entire year. It's all accumulated up to the cross, but now we've seen Jesus is alive. He's walking around again. He lives today. And the question is whether or not that reality affects your faith. Living by faith. Greg's done a wonderful job singing today songs about faith and about believing. And I, oh, I just wish Thomas could have been among us here today and could have heard those encouraging words because Thomas just needed to live by faith. Thomas famously was a doubter, and that's who we'll look at today. If we look kind of contextually where the apostles are at this point. They've already lost one of their number. They're scared for their life. They had lost Jesus. They had lost their purpose. They were behind closed, locked, barred doors, scared for their life, shivering like little children, like little boys, just being afraid of what to do next. And I would be afraid too. But then all of a sudden, into their midst came Jesus. And Thomas, while he was famously the doubter, all 11 of these men shared doubts. They rejected blatant eyewitness accounts about the resurrection of Christ several times. Over and over and over, these men said, he's not alive, he's not alive, he's not alive again. Stop telling us these things. So Jesus appears to these men and later to Thomas to erase their doubts. He wanted to validate His resurrection so that they could become the great evangelists and martyrs that they needed to be. The early church could not have been established without these men. God could have done it, but He chose to do it with these men. So if they stepped down, he would have had to done it some other way. God wanted these men to help establish the early church. They had to rise up to that glorious task in front of them and to embolden them to do that, to help them live by faith. Jesus appeared to erase all doubts. And once they finally, once that click came into place, once they finally saw that he was truly alive again, they could then share the good news. Today... If you do not know that Jesus lives again, you cannot share the good news. I'll go a step further. Please don't try. If you really do not know that Jesus is alive again, and you don't understand how incredible that blessing is, you'll do damage if you try and spread the gospel. Unless you say, go talk to somebody who knows the gospel. That can be your evangelism. But if you finally know that Jesus lives again, you better tell every single person you know. But you can't do that successfully if you have doubts. You can try your best to endure your doubts, but that nagging suspicion, that problem in the back of your mind has to be dealt with. So have any of you ever doubted today? Last week I joked that your preacher was perfect, so I'll raise my hand. I'm the strongest Christian here, and I have doubts. It's okay to laugh at that. I'm not a strong Christian. Every one of them. Think of the uh, the heroes of faith in your life. They have doubted. I can say it unequivocally. The, The strongest in the church have doubted. If the apostles doubted, how could we not doubt? They had eaten with Jesus. They had seen Him. Some had seen Him and still not believed. They doubted, and they're heroes of the faith. We all have doubts. We've got to address them so that we can successfully minister to a world fueled by doubt. The world is filled with people who doubt the reality of Christ, so how can we minister to them if we still have doubts? 
To the apostles, Jesus erased their doubts. To you today, Jesus wants to erase your doubt. So we've got to see this. Jesus wanted to comfort his apostles. He later, initially, intentionally rather, wanted to comfort Thomas. Very personal interaction here with Thomas, and that's what we're going to see today, knowing the application that today Jesus wants to help you erase your doubts. We saw that the resurrection demands verification. He wants you to come to the empty tomb. He wants you to come to him and know that he lives again. Well, let's look at Thomas. Turn to John 20, verse 24 to 29. The first thing we notice is Thomas's absence. See, what we're covering here today is two of the at least recorded ten appearances of Jesus in the Gospels, the fifth and sixth appearance. Something you might miss is that Jesus appeared two times in this instance to all of the apostles. But the first time, the fifth appearance of Jesus, Thomas was not there. And we see from the fifth appearance, when Thomas was absent, incredible things being done by Jesus for the apostles. He wished them peace. He says, peace be on you. I'm not, I'm not a spirit. I'm not a ghost. I have flesh and bones. Let's share a meal together. To the rest of the apostles, who all doubted, Jesus said, look at my hands. Look at my feet. Look at my side. Come touch it if you would like. Verify and authenticate my reality. I am here before you. I have risen and I live again. Physically. He entered the locked doors. He appeared among them to erase their doubts. And he did some incredible things as well. Why was Thomas not there? All of the other apostles were gathered together except for Thomas. And Thomas missed these incredible things because of his absence. Now, it's easy to give Thomas excuses because I give myself excuses, okay? Maybe he wasn't there because he just had a headache. Maybe he was there because he had a sore throat. Maybe company had come. He was with them. Maybe he left Jerusalem. Maybe he was so scared that he ran completely away. Maybe he was just tired. Really, if, if I want to make this personal, if I'm Thomas, I'm so stricken by grief. I'm so mad and frustrated. When I get in that state of mind, I don't want to be around a single person. Is that like you? Are you like me in that? Thomas had just lost his Savior, just lost his best friend, just, like, just lost Jesus. Uh, these women and crazy people are telling him he's alive again. I don't want to listen to anybody. Just let me go be in a cabin in the woods somewhere. Let me just shut down and shut everybody out completely so that I can come to terms with my grief. Maybe that's why Thomas wasn't there that day. He just didn't want to talk about the crucifixion. He didn't want to speculate about Jesus being a ghost again. He just didn't want to be around people. Whatever the reason, and that... Thomas may not be as weak as me. Maybe he just missed it. Whatever the reason, he was not there and he missed out on some incredible things. Jesus shows up and he gives the apostles peace. He shows them himself. In this interesting interaction, he breathed the Holy Spirit on them, indicating the future receipt of the Holy Spirit that they were about to be given. Thomas, you should have been there, man. You missed some incredible things. You missed some wonderful blessings. You see, very basic understanding here, to receive Jesus' blessings, you have to be where Jesus is. Verse 24 of John 20, very simply says that Thomas wasn't there. John records, now Thomas, one of the twelve, one of the main guys, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. Imagine Jesus doesn't come back again. He didn't have to reappear. He already conquered death. He, he did it to embolden the apostles. We've already seen why he did it. He appeared to over 500 people to authenticate. He has risen. You cannot snuff this out, Rome. I'm going to show people that I'm still alive. But directly to Thomas, another appearance of Jesus was not guaranteed. He may potentially have missed his one shot at seeing Jesus because he was not there. He, he didn't have peace when the other apostles had peace. He, he didn't have faith because the apostles, they could see him, they could touch him, they knew he was real. Uh, Thomas missed it all. He missed out on the gift of peace that Jesus offered. He should have been there. Today, to receive Jesus' blessings, just like Thomas, you have to be where he is. This was a Sunday meeting of the apostles, so the application is an easy one. If you miss a Sunday you may miss Jesus. And you desperately need Jesus. 
Thomas missed it. What do you miss when you forsake the assembly of God's people? I'm not talking about a scattered Sunday off here and there. We've got some people sick. That's a good reason to stay home. We don't want all of us to be sick with what's going on around right now. But if you forsake the assembly of God's people, can you really complain when your faith is filled with doubts? Can you really complain if you don't feel a special connection to Jesus anymore? I just don't feel His love anymore. I don't feel like He blesses me anymore. You're not where He is. You're not trying to be among His people. If you have any doubts, wouldn't you want to come to a room of detectives who constantly in our life of faith search out the truth of Jesus? That's what we all do as Christians, right? We all go to the truth. We apply it to our life. We try and find more evidence of Christ for our own verification, validation, and encouragement. And you and I sometimes don't want to go and find that encouragement. We don't want to go be where the believers are so that we can support them and they can support us so that we can all experience Jesus together. Thomas, you missed out. Now, attendance is not the standard. Being here is not as important as being here and involving yourself in the church. But there are so many blessings you can receive just by filling a seat. It's not everything. Living the Christian life is what we all need to do. But how many people leave Sunday morning and say, boy, I feel worse because I went to church. I did a bad job that Sunday if you ever said that, okay? I feel worse because I received God's blessings today. I feel worse because I saw Brother Steve and he gave me a hug that I needed this week. I feel worse because so many people dealing with sickness showed me their strength and showed me their power, showed me their encouragement. Boy, I just wish I skipped church. Nobody in their right mind would say that. Thomas, you missed out. So many blessings come just by being present. And Thomas wasn't. Now thankfully, for Thomas's sake, Jesus reappeared again. And let's address Thomas's doubt here. Let's move next. Thomas's absence. Now we see Thomas's doubt. After Jesus left this meeting of the ten apostles, without Thomas, there was only ten, because Judas was gone at this time, the apostles came to Thomas, they found him or he found them, and they told him about the events. They said, we have seen the Lord. We saw Jesus. We touched His side. He ate with us. He's not a spirit. He's not a ghost. He's not a dream. He's real. We saw Him. We talked to Him. Let us erase your doubts. Didn't work for Thomas. He still doubted. Now, really, contextualize this. Frame this properly here. This is not ten strangers off the street mocking you and telling you that your Savior lives even though you saw Him die. This was ten of His most trusted, loved companions, brothers, friends. They had suffered together persecution for three years. They all responded to the call of Jesus. They knew not to lie about this. You, you wouldn't lie to a grieving person about a resurrected Savior. You wouldn't do that. Especially if you loved Thomas. You wouldn't do that to him. That would be torturous to him. These are the people you can trust, Thomas. But blinded by pride and anger and shame and maybe embarrassment for not being there last time, he denied it. And Thomas said, as we'll see briefly from verse 25, unless I see it, I will not believe it. Let's look at verse 25 of John chapter 20. So, after Jesus left, the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, and listen to this qualification he puts Listen to the defining characteristic of his doubt. Unless I see his hands, uh, see in his hands the marks of the nails, and place my finger into the marks of the nails, not seeing them is good enough, I've got to feel them, and I've got to put my hand into his side. Look at the final four words there. I will never believe. It's not as if I I'm going to struggle with this here, I, I may be convinced. Unless I see his hand, touch his hand, touch his side, I will never believe again. Imagine if Jesus didn't reappear and those conditions that Thomas placed upon his doubt were never met. I will never believe. You really want to be that ignorant to put such strict qualifications around your doubt? You, how many people today echo Thomas's sentiment here? 
Unless Jesus meets a thousand of my conditions, I will never believe. Now, I understand Thomas's desire to validate the truth for himself because I see that in myself. I can be very skeptical. Uh, Jamie told me the other day about a, a, a restaurant going up in Jonesboro. It was in one ear, out the other. Then we drove past it and I said, hey, there's a restaurant being built there. Chase, I told you that. I, I didn't make the connection until I saw it and validated it myself. And, and then there's more important matters than just a restaurant being built in, in, in town that I am skeptical of, that I need to validate, that I need to see for myself and say, okay, now I know it's true. So I can sympathize with Thomas here. I can see how he felt the way that he did. I need to see it myself. It's not a bad thing to want to see the resurrected Lord. But to put such strict qualifications on it, it's as if, using the silly example, that restaurant doesn't exist until I see it. Of course it exists. You're just the fool. You're just the one who won't accept it. Don't be so bold as to put such strict qualifications on your doubt. Be quick to trust trustworthy people. It's my wife. It's the, it's the ten apostles. It's trustworthy sources. There's no reason for them to lie about this. Imagine your whole family gathering around you if you've got a perfect Hallmark family that loves you, that's, that's perfect in every way, and they say, you need to believe this. You need to see this. No, really. And you still rejected it. Why did Thomas doubt? Why did Thomas reject it? His heart betrayed him. His emotions betrayed him. He was so enveloped in grief and anger and bitterness, he could not see the truth directly in front of his face. Until Jesus appeared, and thankfully he would. But, but the, the conditions are too strong here. Thomas left no room for nego negotiations. He said, unless I do exactly what I want to do to meet my requirements for Christ, I will never believe. Unless Jesus heals my child, I will never believe. Unless Jesus removes this temptation from me, I will not go to church. How many people today put qualifications on their faith and they are foolish for it? How many of us have put qualifications on our faith? And maybe it's not your faith entirely, but it's the level of your faith. I'll be a stronger Christian if God does such and such for me. Equally foolish. Don't put qualifications around Jesus. Let Him be Jesus and you just believe in Him, okay? Thankfully, Thomas's conditions were met. He may have eventually been convinced by the apostles that Jesus did really live again if they had a longer time to convince him. But thankfully, Jesus, knowing Thomas's doubts, appeared specially for him. Look at Thomas's belief now. We saw his absence, we saw his doubt, and now finally, thank goodness, we see Thomas's belief. We'll see this in verse 26 to 29 briefly. But as we read verse 26 when we get there, I want you to notice the first, uh, b the beginning of verse 26. Eight days later, a week passed by. Thomas denied Jesus' resurrection to his brother's face, to the other apostles, eight days in a row. How did that week feel for Thomas? What do you think Thomas was doing that week? I bet that week was torture for Thomas. Every, uh, no one likes living in disbelief. No one likes living in doubt and grief. He had to live with his denial and rejection for a week. And I believe the apostles loved Thomas enough to approach him more than once. It's not as if, uh, no, I don't believe. All right, fine. Guys, he doesn't believe. We shouldn't bother him anymore. They came back to him. No, he's really here. We really saw him. He, this is where he sat. He, he ate this fish with us. He was really here. Eight days. A week. Not real, not real, not real. The apostles didn't give up, but Thomas would not believe. So now, praise God, Jesus reappears and Thomas is present. To his credit, for all of his doubt, he appeared the next Sunday to the weekly gathering of the apostles. He was there in the upper room this time. Now Jesus appears and seemingly singles out Thomas, erasing the doubts that Thomas had that he had already erased for the other apostles. 
Look at verse 26 through 29 and see this personal interaction here. Eight days later of dealing with doubt, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them this time. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then immediately he turned to Thomas before Thomas could open his big fat mouth. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Then Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. <laughs> Look at verse 27. Jesus, how do you know Thomas's conditions? Uh, before Thomas could say a word, Thomas, you wanted to see my hands? Here they are. You wanted to feel them? Reach out your finger. You wanted to feel my side? Put your hand here. I know your doubts. I know your struggles. I want to erase them. I want to address them. I want you to believe in me. Let me meet all of your conditions. And this is a special interaction here. Don't put conditions around your faith. But Jesus met exactly the conditions Thomas put up. He knew Thomas's struggles and addressed them all one by one. Put your finger here, put your hand here, see, touch, believe. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Your translation may be a little bit different there at the end of verse 27. Others say, be not unbelieving, but believing. That's a little bit more powerful there. Thomas embodied disbelief. He was unbelieving. Thomas the doubter. That's who he was in that moment. Jesus says, don't be that anymore. Do not disbelieve. Be not unbelieving. Be believing. Believe, Thomas. I don't know if he had to shout those words through Thomas's thick skull like he sometimes has to do to me. But realize today I'm echoing the sentiment of Christ to you. Some of you are unbelief. Some of you are disbelieving. And you're a Christian who is in unbelief. You are a Christian who is disbelieving. I'm not questioning your salvation, but I am questioning your faith. Jesus yells through your thick skull and through mine, do not disbelieve, but believe. Don't be unbelieving anymore. How'd you like it for a week? You didn't like it, right? Quit it then. I'm really here. I'm erasing your doubts. I'm proving my resurrection to you. And Thomas beautifully responds, maybe through tears, my Lord and my God. Summed up in all of that is you're real. You're alive. I was wrong. I'm so glad I was wrong. I'm so sorry for that. All summed up in the worship of the Lord, my Lord and my God. I see your deity. I see your lordship. I see your power. I see your authority. My Lord and my God. You are really here. I will not disbelieve anymore. Now, imagine Thomas' reaccounting of this event when he was ministering the gospel to others. Man, you won't believe. I doubt it. I was just like you. I disbelieved. He showed me there's no reason to doubt. There's no reason to be disbelieving or to be disbelief anymore. Do not disbelieve, church, but believe. Somewhere down the road, we have to come to that same conclusion that Thomas came to. We all have to come to faith through belief. It's a question for you and for me. The rest of the apostles already had faith. Thomas didn't. The rest of the church today may have faith, but if you don't, you don't. The church can't save you. You've got to save you. We can help you along. It's the best place to be. Don't be absent like Thomas was. Be believing. Have you ever had doubts in your faith? Do not be discouraged. Jesus erases all of your doubts, all of your fears, all of your questions, all of your hesitations. Go to Jesus and they will be removed. He has all of the answers. Now, unlike Thomas, we do not get a personal appearance of Jesus. But the faith that we do hold on to is even better than Thomas's. Jesus said to Thomas, you've seen and you believed? Blessed are those who believed without seeing. And then... Verse 30 and 31, I wanted to include this as well. John 20, verse 30 to 31. John writes, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written. These signs and these truths are written for a purpose, 
so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in His name. Do you believe? Because if you do, you may have life. Do you doubt? Because if you do, you cannot have life. It's really that simple. But if you doubt, there is an answer. You don't have to remain in your doubt anymore. Jesus has all the answers you need. He has faith enough to share with you. Courage, power, bravery, wisdom enough for you. If you want to conquer your doubts instead of your doubts conquering you, you've got to come to Christ. You've got to come to Jesus. If you have doubts, let Jesus erase them today so that you too can minister to the world and share the gospel. And once you know and believe, the gift of life is offered to you. So today, if you have any doubts, you need to come to Jesus Look just like Thomas did. You need to validate, verify. You need to authenticate. Jesus is real. He is still living. And He did it all for me. If you need to be baptized, we can baptize you into Christ, giving you His resurrection for yourself so that you can live eternally with Him. But if you're just struggling, your doubts, have, you've been wrestling with them for too long and you're tired, you're exhausted, let the church take them on with you. We can pray for you. If there's anything we can do, please come while we stand and while we sing to encourage you. sheds on our way while we do his good will he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey trust and obey for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all on the altar we lay for the favor He shows and the joy He bestows are for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do, where He says we will go, never fear, only trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Be seated, please. Church, I'm glad you're here today to support a fellow brother. Mark Vaughn has come forward, and before he said, Chase, I don't know if I'm the right kind of guy to come forward. I've never thought of myself as someone that needs to come forward, but I think that's all of us, brother. It's not a, it's not a moment of weakness at all. It's a moment of strength. He expresses he's been dealing with some difficulties in his, in his family. He knows the truth. He knows the right thing to do. It's just hard being the bigger man, isn't it, church? It's hard living with the burden of truth that we have, and I hate that family can sometimes be a thorn in our side, but thankfully we all have God as our Father. We all have our spiritual family. We all have our church. So we want to honor Mark's request, pray that he has the strength and wisdom he needs to deal with his loved ones, to be the husband and the man he needs to be. So we're going to pray for Mark, and we thank him for his, his openness and his honesty. Let's pray. 
Father, as, as bearing the burden of truth and as living righteously is a difficulty we all must endure, we know the reward is worth it. We know that heaven is worth it. We know that being Christ-like in and of itself is worth it. But nevertheless, Father, it's difficult. And when we have those come in our lives that tempt us, that frustrate us, that aggravate us, our human side can come out. And I pray that when that happens to all of us, Father, as Mark has expressed, you forgive us as you forgive Mark. You allow him and the burden that he bears to be lifted, that he can find peace in being Christ-like, that uh, uh, being the bigger man, he gives that responsibility to Jesus. And he allows Jesus to be the bigger man for him as he is for us all. We pray that Mark can be the man and the family member he needs to be, that he is the support as the husband to his wife that he needs to be. And I pray that you offer that same encouragement and strength to all of us as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand for our closing song, please. Thank you, Chase, for a great lesson in helping us all with our doubts and weak faith. <clears throat> Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this wonderful day you have given us to come and spend time worshiping you. And please help what we can take uh, from Chase's lesson and apply it to our lives. And be with us as we go out into uh, our everyday lives and shine your light before everyone and be a good example. Please be with the sick and help them get better and forgive us for all our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.